Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Patricia, your host, and today is episode 7 of the second series. Time is flying. It's supposed to be spring, but as I record this, my garden is covered in snow and looking out the window, there's no sign of the snowfall getting any lighter. I just hope my magnolia tree, which was about to blossom, can withstand the deluge. Anyway, what's happening in today's podcast? Well, I thought I'd talk about ego in haiku. Then I have a new poet for us to meet, Wayne Kingston. And of course, I have news of the Renku we're writing together. But before I go on, I have to share something with you which has kept me smiling since I read it. It was a tweet by Gregory Finn in which he said, I was cool. Can you, can you hear me beaming about this? I wanted to tell my children straight away, naturally. But they'd never believe me. Anyway, to quote him in full, if you've been thinking about submitting but putting it off, just do it. Patricia is cool and it's a pretty great feeling to hear your writing read out loud. Thanks so much, Gregory. And if you're listening and haven't plucked up the courage to submit, do as he says. I love reading your haiku in Senryu. Another thank you must go to Roger Watson. Thanks to his good work, Poetry P has two mentions on the haiku in English Wikipedia page. He's asked for help in updating the page, so if you're interested, contact him. I'm sure he'll tell you what to do. Particularly if, like myself, you're clueless. On to my topic, ego and haiku. Now what follows is an opinion and not a definitive teaching of the process or the rules of haiku writing, because if there's one thing we all know, rules change and evolve. My starting point was that I'm not the greatest fan of haiku or senryu, in which the personal emotions of the poet intrude forcefully into the work. These works are too self-indulgent for my taste. I think there's a fine line between the use of aesthetics to create emotive responses, joy or sadness, and indulging in your own mood. As Azuchi says, when one is overwhelmed by sorrow, that sorrow cannot produce a haiku. When one is joyful and immersed in happiness, that feeling cannot produce a haiku. We need a little distance, don't you think? The sentimental content of such a poem may forge a verse that is likeable. Why? Because it appeals to the common denominators of the human psyche. However, this does not a haiku make. In such haiku, the expression of visceral emotion is all too reminiscent of the presentation of transparent feeling and empty social exchange in the media. That's according to Bruce Ross. Indeed, These days, social media has a great deal to answer for. How many saccharine or maudlin poems do we see which are purporting to be haiku on such platforms? I know it's very tempting to, shall we say, go a little overboard in our sentimentality or passion when writing. My own haiku notebook is full of overblown examples which I really, really must get down to editing because most of them stand, well... A chance of being saved, if I give them a little bit of distance and perspective. Now I'd like to give you an example of work that has managed to tone down the emotions. Alan Summers has written a haiku which is on an especially emotive subject, but the ego is contained, the emotion restrained, and yet the sabi gives the poem gravitas. As Alan has not pushed his sorrow upon us, We have the space to empathise with the work, and by extension, with him. What do you think? Let's hear it. The rain almost a friend, this funeral. Taking this a step further, when we write haiku, shouldn't we aim to eliminate the self, the ego, and in so doing, eliminating the physical barrier between ourselves and nature? taking care that we do not interject anything of our personal or egoistic needs between ourselves and the experience. Personally, I aspire to this level of expertise. I work to achieve it, but I can say it happens, well, at least for me, only once in a blue moon. I have some examples of what can be achieved 
when it does work. My Hands Becoming Crocus Blossoms That's by Bob Boldman We know the poet is participating in the work, but the barriers between himself and nature have been erased. What do you think? And this one by Arizona Zipper I stop to listen. The cricket has done the same. I feel like the cricket and the poet are breathing as one, which is daft, I know, but can't you feel them as one being? So at the end of my reading for this podcast, I set myself the goal of working harder at my editing, of being much more aware of my ego. Editing, though, is hard, isn't it? Perhaps a topic for another day. Next, I'd like to introduce you to a poet new to the podcast, Wayne Kingston. Wayne is a retired gentleman from the US. He's a poet who searches till the poetic perfection of an image conveys a thought so pure and universal one cannot help but weep, then act. He sets high expectations of himself. Shall I read you a sample of his work? Virtue, border wall breach, Vice. I've read this up and down, inside and out, and every time I read it, I get a different interpretation or return to a previous one. How do you interpret it? Impetuous torrent peppers the plate glass. Sanctuary cafe. The alliteration with the P just adds power to the verse, and I felt this was almost synesthetic. Can't you hear the violence of the rain? I asked Wayne how he came up with it, and he said, It was written as it happened. I was in Starbucks watching the storm roll through a large picture window. Heard the pelting rain, safe, warm, pondering. If you'd like to read more from Wayne, he's two volumes of poetry in print. Eclectic Discernment and Listen Small, both available on Amazon. In episode 5, Aiming for the Moon, I started a new project. I thought we could write a 22-line renku together. I asked you to come up with the next verse, which should have the word moon in it. I have to say thank you to everyone who sent me verses. Truly, they were all brilliant, but I could only choose one. Because I had to decline so many excellent stanzas, I'm changing the way I move forward. I want to promote good haiku, and it goes against the grain with me to decline pieces of work that are really terrific. The good news is, we're still going to write this together. I know there are enough of you who'd like to take part. What I'll do now is ask individuals to write verses for the renku. So if you haven't told me you want to get involved, now is the time to drop me an email. Contacts on the Poetry P website if you haven't got them already. The moon verse that I chose was one by M. Shane Pruitt. Water lilies floating amongst the stars, twin moons. I then added two new verses as prescribed by Jane Reichold. Would you like to hear the Renko as it stands at the moment? Don't forget, it's also on the website. Cold sun. Aging reflections on orange snowflake. The world turns a half-frozen ball. Over the hill, now I look forward to the sunset. In the valley, footprints in the dew. Water lilies floating among the stars, twin moons. A sedentary cat stirs the darkness. Outside the window... The birds sing to themselves. Family breakfast. Shane's verse has to make a shift from verse 3, which it does, sunset to dark night, and a link to verse 4. I felt, coming from an alpine region, that many valleys contain water, and I know my own valley has the most wondrous starscape. Verse 6 shifts from verse 4, from evening to darkness, and links to verse 5 by association to a piece of literature, Haruki Murakami's 
1Q84. In particular, the chapter Town of Cats. If you'd like a taste, I found a chapter printing it, printed in the New Yorker, and of course, the link is on the show notes. Verse 7, also written by me. In days when this would have been written on paper, the same person writes verses 6 and 7, as there's a page turn. And this tries to maintain uh, the flow of the verse. So this verse shifts from verse 5 the darkness, to early morning, and I hope the notion that we're in spring comes through. It links to verse 6 via the cat. Cats usually have families, don't they? So, the next update on the Renku is in a month. I can't wait to see where we get to. Thank you so much for coming along and listening today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Next time, the podcast will be featuring haiku on film, film coup. I have so many wonderful pieces to share with you, but I can always add some more. So like Greg said, if you've been thinking about submitting, but putting it off, just do it. And you've got until the 15th of April to email me your film coup. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I hope you'll join me next time. In the meantime, keep writing. As usual, you should find all the links in the show notes. If something's missing, drop me a mail or tweet me at the Poetry P and I'll sort it out. Ciao.